Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the third webinar in our summer webinar series on building resilient and sustainable communities in Ireland. My name is Aoife Corkin, and I'm a senior staff officer here at the Housing Agency working in the area of sustainable communities. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mary Coffey, who's running the back end of the webinar, and by our guest speaker, Professor Gerald Mills from the School of Geography at University College Dublin. Before we start, I would just like to draw your attention to three things. First of all, we have a questions and answers button at the bottom of the screens. If you have any questions, we'd ask that you use the Q&A function. The Q&A feature provides you with an option to post anonymously. If you just want to make comments, please add them to the chat. As I mentioned last week, we've had lots of requests to share who our webinar participants are. However, for various reasons, we can't do this. But if you'd like to share your name and who you are, um, where you're from, please do so in the chat feature. Finally, just be aware that we are recording this session and it will be made available later on on the Housing Agency YouTube channel. We will also make the slides available. The agenda for today's webinar is as follows. I'll give a very short introduction to the Housing Agency and the webinar series. Professor Jared Mills will then present his work on green spaces and urban places and the importance of green space for neighbourhoods with a particular focus on the Mapping Green Dublin projects. We'll then have a questions and answers session, where we would encourage you to participate and ask any relevant questions you may have. If we can't answer your questions as part of the webinar, we'll make every effort to answer them at a later stage. We'll aim to keep today's webinar to about 50 minutes. So the Housing Agency, which is hosting this series, is a state agency based on Upper Mount Street in Dublin. The Housing Agency, which works with and supports local authorities, approved housing bodies, and the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government and the private housing sector in the delivery of housing and housing services. Our vision is to enable everyone to live in good quality, affordable homes in sustainable communities. It's the housing agency's vision for achieving sustainable communities which inspired this webinar series. And the aim of the webinar series is to contribute to and stimulate a discussion on resilience and sustainability topics which are relevant for housing to raise awareness of the importance of building resilient and sustainable communities in the light of local, national and global shocks to the system, and to create opportunities for collaboration and future projects. This webinar series explores four topics which are relevant for housing. Our first two webinars focused on, on taking a collaborative approach to retrofitting and intergenerational housing and regeneration. Today we're broadening discussion to focus on green spaces in urban places, and especially the importance of green space in neighbourhoods. On that note, I would like to introduce you to Professor Jared Mills. Jared is an Associate Professor at UCD's School of Geography. He's a physical geographer with a research, in, in the distinct, with a research interest in the distinct climates that are found in urban areas. He's worked on the topic of urban climates for over 30 years in the US and in Ireland. His work is fo focused on modelling and measuring the urban climatic effect and developing developing guidelines for urban planning and design. Gerald, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, I guess I should share my screen now. Yep, perfect. All Oh, I assume everybody can see my screen now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Gerald Mills. As Eve indicated, I'm a, a geographer. So that means I'm mostly interested in where things are located and why they're located there. I'm a physical geographer with interest, particularly in cities, which are entirely made by humans. And therefore, we're largely responsible for the type of environment that we end up with. And the reason I guess I fall into the area of looking at trees in particular is because they're often a neglected aspect associated with urban environments. Um, so if I want to understand the climates of the city, one of the primary reasons cities produce different climates is because they're essentially hard landscapes. And they have solid three-dimensional objects, the buildings themselves, that generate turbulence, uh, that block out sunlight, and one of the ways by which you can redeem cities or alter the cities and the effects that you don't like is by planting trees. The example I've given on the right hand side is a North American example where they've actually taken on this board very, very strongly. 
and they use various techniques to try and value the trees and then in a very American way, put a actual monetary amount on it. And that monetary amount is associated with the air quality benefits, uh, the hydrology benefits, and in fact, the health benefits associated with trees. Now I present work here, which is drawn on other people's work also. Uh, the people I want to mention here in particular are Neve Moore and Al McLavin, who are working with me very closely on the Mapping Green Dublin project, but also a colleague of mine, Tina Ningo, who initiated the project by essentially starting to map out trees in the centre of Dublin. So essentially I've divided the presentation into two parts. The first part is a very general thing, talking about my understanding about cities and trees. And then I move far more specifically into the Mapping Green Dublin project to give you a sense for its scope and what it's showing about the uneven distribution of green spaces around Dublin. So generally speaking, green spaces are seen as potentially mitigating our adaptive responses to things that we don't want inside cities. Uh, in the past, this was mostly associated with offsetting, for example, issues of air quality, uh, issues associated with something called the urban heat island, but increasingly people are seeing this as making them more resilient in terms of global climate change, in other words, offsetting carbon emissions, and perhaps offering respite from climates that we don't want by providing outdoor spaces. So you see more and more material in the urban literature precisely about green spaces and the impact that they have on people's well-being and mental health in particular. So the two spaces I've shown you here below, one is of course Dublin city centre viewed from the top of Liberty Hall and of course it shows a hard landscape uh, and in between the hard landscape there are pockets of green spaces such as Merrion Square on the right hand side. If I want to know about what trees can actually give to a place, I do need to know about the age of the trees, the species of trees, their health, and you need to know about the physical dimensions of the trees. In particular, the measure that's often used is this thing called the canopy extent. That's the amount of the area of the city viewed from above that consists of leaf area. And the reason for this is because the leaves themselves are the interactive part of the plant. That's the stuff that provides the shade, the shelter, that alters the temperature, usually lowering it, that raises the humidity, that can scavenge some air pollutants from the atmosphere, not always, that can uh, slow down the rate at which rain rainfall is received at the surface and therefore affect hydrology, including such things as soil erosion. They um, can interfere with noise in the city, at least they can change it. And of course, critically, they can offer biodiversity. And in the urban literature, there's a great deal of options that are often put forward for the types of greening. Um, utilizing the building fabric itself where horizontal space is limited for green walls and green roofs. So you're familiar with the green wall maybe up on the left hand side because that's from Dublin city centre off Stevens Green. The green roof on the lower right hand side is used all the time in America to demonstrate the value of these things is on top of the Chicago City Hall. Um, I think it's questionable as to whether this green roof does anything, given that it's so far above where people actually live. So the best it can offer perhaps is a uh, passive air conditioning for the rooms at the top of the building. Uh, we're familiar with uh, green channels from SUDS, this is the Sustainable Urban Drainage Systems. And we're also familiar perhaps with the potential for replacing some of the hard paving with green paving, which essentially consists of a membrane that's porous. Each of these will do different things uh, and have different effects. Of all the tools that are available, however, trees are regarded as perhaps the most versatile. One thing, trees can be planted in the hard fabric. So they provide an opportunity for the soil to interact with the atmosphere through this hard impermeable layer. It's a hard life for a tree though. They have to deal with lots and lots of pollutants that clog up the stomata through which they exchange information with the atmosphere. Uh, and of course, they regularly get battered by such things as Dublin bus, as you can see on the right hand side here. So myself and Tina over a number of years have done different projects. This is one that we did over a summer. It was quite a dry summer. And we took the leaves off trees and we basically cleaned the leaves and took the sediment that accumulated on them 
and measure just how much stuff goes on that leaf. Um, what the um, dust captures is some of the iron filings and magnetic stuff that's essentially emitted by cars. So there's a few places that we looked at here. There's just one place I'll make to mention to you. It consists of the little circular, sorry, the, um, the square shaped set of circles that you see in the uh, lower right hand side. This is Stevens Green. And you notice that there's big differences between the accumulations in the trees, and this corresponds exactly with where the Lewis is. It also corresponds exactly the high values with where the traffic stops. So this obviously has implications because the trees are here recording the air quality of the atmosphere. And we'll find the worst air quality is located at the traffic stops, which is where all the cars are stopped. And it's also, of course, where all the people are pushing the buttons across the road. In other words, we've created a very good environment for fumigating the population. Um, so over the last several years, we've mapped out trees using different approaches. Um, and there's clear connections between trees, not surprisingly, and canopy cover, and for example, um, property prices. Now, this is quite a complicated relationship. It's not as simple as saying that if I plant a tree, my uh, house property goes up. In fact, what you end up with is that the wealthier neighborhoods have bigger gardens. And that means an awful lot of the trees that are placed in those gardens are privately owned. Whereas you can see in this case here, the dark red areas are the areas which are largely deprived, deprived of tree cover. And you see that they're focused very much in the city center, sending out toward the southwest, toward Inchicore, and toward, um, well, toward Tala. In the upper right-hand corner, upper left-hand corner, sorry, you'll see the, the price properties, which you can, by the way, download relatively easily from the um, price property registry. And you see there's a clear link between the higher values of houses and the tree cover. As I say, it's not causal, but it clearly uh, the two things are correlated. And in fact, in Dublin as a whole, there's a clear strategy and uh, determination to try and improve the green space in Dublin. So they're talking about making it a more sustainable city through increased greening. And for trees in particular, uh, a vision for the long-term planting, protection and maintenance of trees, hedgerows and woodlands within Dublin city. A proactive and systemic good practice approach to tree management uh, to encourage and promote tree planting and planning in the development of urban spaces, streets, etc. Now what they're effectively describing here is almost like an urban forest approach to the management of trees. Uh, There's an idea that's emerged over the last couple of decades is that we don't try to treat each tree in the city as though it were an individual. Instead, we look at the entire uh, network. I think an important thing to point out, however, and you'll see this emerge, is that Dublin City's plan obviously can only refer to the stuff that Dublin City owns. And you'll see that a great amount of the uh, green infrastructure in the city actually exists in private landscapes. That's either private gardens or in institutional lands. So the term that's used all the time in this field is the right tree. That means choosing the right species. So you don't end up with the tree that becomes enormous and heaves up the road in the right place. So that means that street trees are different from dry trees in parks. And here's the last thing, the right time. And this goes back to this idea about having a healthy urban forest. Um, there's a big push on at the moment in many cities to have, say, a million trees planted. Um, and generally what this means is those million trees all grow up the same age and they all die at the same time. So to manage as an urban forest, what you do is you look for diversity uh, in terms of species, in terms of ages, and you look for diversity in terms of the types of trees in given places. There's actually a, uh, a large body of existing work on the value of trees and I think this is the best site for simple tools to evaluate the green infrastructure that you have and the possibilities. This is called iTree, and it's based in the United States, comes out of the United States Forestry Administration. And what they do is they provide a set of tools for you to evaluate green spaces at different levels in the, in the community. Individual trees, trees within neighborhoods, and trees on an urban scale. And typically, in order for you to design a policy, what you'd have to do is, first of all, do some form of a census. And that census would tell you something about the trees, where they're located, what types of trees they are, how healthy they are, etc. 
And then you'd use this as a base for doing ecosystem analyses. Now, trees obviously do a lot more than that. Um, and there's a great deal of sociological work that indicates the importance of trees for mental health and for um, physical health. Um, but the tools have not been structured in quite the same way. I think part of the reason why it's been so big in the United States is because the United States, they put a cost on air quality in terms of health, which means it's relatively easy for them to convert the amount of air pollution taken out of the atmosphere into what they believe are the health savings that accrue from having a greening strategy. So out of the original work that uh, Tina did, uh, we undertook a project with Dublin City Council and the other, four, the other three local authorities and the OPW to map out the tree population across the entire county area, which is quite large. It's uh, 970 square kilometers. So uh, what we did was we sampled. And we sampled in more detail once we got into the urbanized landscape and in a less detailed fashion when we were in the large open fields of Fingal, for example. So the numbers you see on the left-hand side for local authority are DCC, Dublin City, but nearly right down Fingal and South Dublin County Council. And you can see that the proportion of the landscape occupied by trees, shrubs and grasses differs between each one of them. Um, for example, Dublin right down has by far and away the largest canopy cover. Fingal is quite a low cover, but in fact, you can see why, because most of Fingal is in fact agricultural, so the only trees that exist there are usually the boundaries of fields. If we compare Dublin against other cities around Europe, for example, at about 10%, we pretty much lie in the middle. But making these comparisons is very difficult for a couple of reasons. One is obviously the tree populations are different. The other is that how you define the city also varies. So for example, we have that value for Stockholm, Sweden of 57%, uh, but a great deal of Stockholm is water. Uh, so the actual physically occupied part of the city is quite small. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives you an idea. In fact, in order for us to try and overcome this, we did a study ourselves comparing cities using the same template. So for that data, the ones I just showed you, we took the I tree and we calculated essentially how much carbon dioxide, how much nitrogen oxides, ozone, sulfur dioxide, etc., will be removed from the atmosphere from the, that tree population. Now, important to point out here is that I'm not saying this is the amount that is taken out because that depends on the contents of the atmosphere. But these are the capacity of the current stock to take materials out of the atmosphere. And just to put it in some sort of um, context, we often say the trees can offset global warming by taking carbon dioxide in, of course they can, but there is no way you'll ever plant enough trees in the city to remove the carbon dioxide that's generated on a daily basis inside the city. We estimate that it would take 100 years for the trees in the city simply to remove the traffic generated in just one year. So in other words, yes, they're very good from taking out carbon dioxide and taking other pollutants, but I'm afraid it's not a substitute for simply uh, controlling the emissions. Here's an attempt to try and um, control for the fact that cities are all have different boundaries. What we did was we simply put a dot in the center of each of these cities. So those are the five cities in the Republic of Ireland and also I did Belfast and Derry. Um, and we compared them against equivalent types of information gathered from some cities around Europe. So for example, you see Belfast has got practically very little green space in the city center. But each of the ones have you know, distinct patterns. For example, Limerick's quite interesting because all the trees you can see are in the suburban areas outside the commercial city centre, which is quite strange because uh, much of Limerick is designed almost to have large trees because they've got big Georgian roads. You can see Watford, the medieval city is practically bereft. Uh, and in Cork and Galway, you'll see distinct patterns and that's largely associated with where the, where the shipping industry used to occupy parts of the city. So I think if you're going to try and change a place from what it is now to what it might be, you have to look at the amount of space that's available and where it's located. Um, it would seem to me that in Dublin city centre in particular, uh, the only way you can radically increase greening is either simply planting more trees in the roads 
or else you have to take over some of the derelict, derelict land, or else you'd have to start planting on top of the roofs of buildings. Uh, the latter, people often suggest, what I think is a major, major investment in infrastructure because there's not too many buildings that can hold decent vegetation. So this takes me down to essentially the project Mapping Green Dublin. Um, so the idea behind this was it's an EPA funded project. The EPA funded project uh, was to fund an examination, a detailed examination of the ecosystems provided by trees in a part of Dublin to seek out the gaps, to engage with the local community to talk about how we might address those for the benefit of all. And then finally to treat, try and see if we can get some action. Now the project's actually quite short, it's about 24 months, so I'm about halfway through it at the moment. And in fact, <clears throat> it's a bit unfortunate, but of course our engagement with the community is occurring at exactly the same time as COVID. So I'll tell you a bit as to how we try to address or take into account that and make use of it rather than actually see it as a, a barrier. Uh, so in this work, I work with Maynooth University, uh, a group called Common Ground, which are based in uh, in Chicor, EPA obviously, Dublin City Council are helping us, and Connect the Dots are offering a, an opportunity to bring all the groups together. So this is the basic structure of it. So uh, I've been working on the gap analysis, creating the data set. It overlaps with the co-creation process. This is where we take the information from gathering information about vegetation in the city and then talk to the local community. And the next challenge will be to try and take some of the stuff that we already have and actually uh, get actions out of it. So a lot of our work has been spent on the basic data structure uh, and on the cooperation. And we're hoping on the basis of that to come up with the, the suitable policies so that we can engage with people who can actually carry out actions and perhaps green this part of the city. We're not alone. There are lots of other projects happening in the city centre at the moment in line with that strategy I talked before about in Dublin City Council. Um, the northeast inner city has already had a greening strategy. There is currently a Liberties greening strategy. Uh, Liberties is probably one of the most desolate parts of Dublin in terms of green spaces. Uh, all it has are relatively small parks. Or they're um, in the midst of actually to create new parks. And there's a project happening over in Stony Batter which is a sort of lower working, sorry, lower middle class neighborhood that was built with no trees. And they're talking about how to <coughs> uh, place trees into that environment. So those are all happening simultaneously. Uh, it wasn't by design, but to some extent, it makes sense if the Northeast inner city and the Liberties and Stony Batter are all trying to do something, then we're hoping that our project can slot in nicely with some of the ideas that they have. So let me tell you um, how we did the mapping and also what the results show. I took the opportunity, frankly, to um, map out all the trees in Dublin City Centre. And rather than doing a sample, we decided in terms of the actual census uh, to measure and try to get information about every single tree inside the city. So the way we did this was we took an extremely detailed satellite image, which you can see on the left hand side here. And that detailed image was provided by Blue Sky. So the Department of Geography uh, purchased it. And you can see here, we've identified the center of the tree canopy and we place a dot on it. This was done manually. It was done over the summer months by myself, Kina Ningal and a set of other students. I have another image, which is shown on the right-hand side. This is called a digital elevation model. And digital elevation model uh, provides information about the heights of objects on the landscape. So I have the dots and I have the heights. So I place the dots on top of the digital elevation model. I can estimate the heights of trees. And that's the fundamental database that we start to assemble. Okay, sorry. So here's the map. Uh, there are over 300,000 trees on this map. And the boundary you see here is the boundary of Dublin City Council area. I've shown a sort of stippled area of the parks and open green spaces, uh, but the heavier green dots represent the trees themselves. Uh, it'll become clear in a moment as to where there's lots of trees and where there's few trees. So you'll see all sorts of patterns there. For example, you'll see the trees along 
the line of the Tolka. Uh, you can see the trees around Donnybrook. Uh, at the very, very end, you might see a whole series of lines of trees, which is the golf course, which is just outside, um, just outside uh, RT Studios. And then, of course, you can see Phoenix Park. And you can see the trees along the western edge um, going out by the River Liffey. So let me try and then abstract information from this. The first thing I did was I identified using other data sets. Um, and there are quite sophisticated and detailed data sets produced by the Ordnance Survey of Ireland as to where these trees were located. Uh, this is an estimate because I don't have exact uh, information about who owns property. So I estimated uh, what was a private garden based upon the typical plot size of a garden across Dublin. So we estimate that a substantial number of trees are actually located in private gardens, almost 100,000. Of the remainder, they're split about evenly between what's on a road and what's in a park. And the other ones constitute a form of stuff we find in institutions. Those could be private schools, uh, there could be places like, um, like um, what's it, Technical University of Dublin over in Grange Gorman, which is a substantial number of trees. Um, what I've listed here are the estimated tree heights. This is based upon the digital elevation model. The height is a good indication of the age of the tree. So you see that the trees which are located on roads, most of them are relatively young. They're less than 15 meters tall. You'll see that the uh, trees that are in parks are slightly older. Uh, almost one quarter of them are between 15 and 25 meters tall. The ones in gardens are the youngest of the lot. Very, very few of them are very, very big. So this gives you a sense as to where the trees are located. It also tells us that, for example, in terms of Dublin City Council and its opportunity to manage the tree stock, it's largely responsible for the roads and for the parks. But private gardens and the private institutions, those trees are largely, um, and their management is in the hand of private owners. So, this is my attempt to try and abstract the information. What I've done here is I've essentially superimposed a grid on top of the entire landscape and did a density count. So density count indicates uh, how many trees are in an area and I've done it, I've expressed it relatively speaking. So for example, if you look at very low, well not surprisingly, the Bull Island, which is this strip you see on the right hand side, well that Bull Island is mostly marram grass, so there's not any trees there. The interesting parts of the city, I think, are the areas around the port areas, which are undergoing major redevelopment at the moment. And you can see on the north side and the south side of the city, they still look like they did when they were actually port areas. They're still largely impervious. That impervious area extends largely through the city centre. And there's areas of which I just identified around the Liberties, where it's especially very low. And then you can see a stretch out toward Dolphins Barn, Crumlin, out toward Cherry Orchard. It's important to mention a couple of things here. First of all, this is the tree cover. It does not necessarily indicate the green cover. And the reason I point this out is because if you look at the area of Phoenix Park, you'll see that the large areas, which are like these green prairies in the middle of the park, come out as having very low tree cover. That's because they're grass. Nevertheless, you'll see that the greenest parts of Dublin are located in the suburban and the more wealthy suburban parts of Dublin, that's Dublin Southwest, and then you'll see a green area extending from Clontarf through Fairview over toward Castlenock. It's possible using the height and um, simple rules to estimate the size of the canopy. So here is a detailed map of the canopy height in the city centre, which indicates obviously, as you can see, the major clusters of trees in the pocket parts of Dublin and in particular, Phoenix Park itself, of course. But you'll also see the large parts of the city that are largely have very, very few trees. You can see the um, two sort of boulevards, the South Circle Road and the North Circle Road, the areas around the canals, are also well treated. So, how do I make use of these? Well, one of the reasons why uh, we want to know about the trees is their capacity for taking care of air quality. And in Dublin, um, 
not always the case everywhere in Ireland, but in Dublin, the major source of poor air quality is traffic. And it's possible to get traffic information, um, which is modeled for all the streets in Dublin. So here's average hourly traffic flow through all the streets in Dublin. So we can expect that the streets that have the largest amount of traffic have the gener generate the largest amount of emissions. And therefore, those communities will suffer especially from air quality issues associated with air pollution. And the international literature shows, yes, that air pollution from cars will spread over the city, but the highest concentrations of, say, for example, the particulate matters and nitrogen oxides is extremely close to the road itself. <clears throat> so let me try and put all this stuff together in a, in a way that actually uh, has an effect on a community. It is possible using the census to get information on areas around the city. So this represents one type of geographic data. It's also possible, I've just shown you, to get traffic information for the city, but this consists largely of lines of information. And then, of course, finally, there's the trees themselves, which is point level data. So what I'm going to try to do now is put together all this information so that we're not just looking at trees where there's nobody and we're not looking at trees where there is no real issues. In other words, trees to compensate for low traffic. So I'm going to look for places now that have um, high population, which indicates high exposure, uh, that has high amounts of traffic, which indicates uh, large emissions and has fewest trees. In other words, places for which they you could actually strategize as to where you want to plant trees or modulate traffic in the future. So what I've done is I've superimposed a grid on top of all these types of data. The cell grid size is 200 meters on the side. I add up the trees inside each cell. I estimate the population in each cell. And what I do is I divide up the traffic flows along the lines and count up the number of cars in each cell. So I'm attempting Come with the measure of just how urban a place is. Here's the first thing I did. So now you can see everything is reduced to a cell. Each of these cells are 200 meters on a side, um, which is, I think, is an interesting idea because if you think about the COVID, we we're all restricted initially to within one kilometer of our houses. So each of these cells represent 200 meters. So it gives you a sense of what you can accomplish within that within that distance frame. Uh, I've excluded all the cells for which the population is less than 100. But this has certain advantages because first of all, your eye is immediately drawn to where you see the highest green, which of course is over in Phoenix Park, but very, very few people live there. You'll see the areas around Blue Bell, for example, over on the left-hand side. These are large warehouse areas in the city. You'll see the areas over in the Docklands. They're not green. I think they offer enormous potential for eating. But they're not green, but there's nobody living there. And you can see St. Dan's Park up on the, um, on the Clontarf Road. <clears throat> so what we're left with now is population and trees. And not surprisingly, it shows that the people in the city centre in general have um, there's more than 10 persons per tree. Whereas if I go toward Donnybrook, there are probably more trees than residents. And now you can see the patterns clearly emerge. Essentially, the city centre and the areas especially to the southeast are deprived of trees, relatively speaking, and other areas are relatively wealthy in terms of trees. And this is just a, a bar graph showing the distribution of the trees and their frequency across the city itself. So what I've done is simply count up the number of cells. So you can see there's relatively few cells, uh, less than 75, they have less than 25 trees within that 200 by 200 cell, whereas most cells will have between 75 and 150. So here's my measure of urbanization. <clears throat> if we take urban to mean that there's going to be lots of traffic, few trees, and yet a high population, then where do I see a combination of all those three things? And of course, you won't be surprised, it extends through the city centre, not surprisingly, because that's where most of the jobs are during the daytime. In fact, the population inside the city centre, inside the canal, is one and a half times larger during the daytime, because of traffic bringing people in, than it is at night time. You'll see that the other areas that pop out here as having high, 
places like Ballymun, uh, parts of Finglas, Dunnycarney, um, and even parts of Rathmines. And you can see small sections of Clontarf where there's a big road taking people into the city. So this is a measure of urbanization. So if we were to have a tree planting strategy, which was to try and manage um, air quality, uh, I think you'd have to take into account where people live um, and where the trees are not. Uh, there's only two ways out of this, obviously. Uh, you can plant more trees, but I think fundamentally you have to change traffic patterns if you're to uh, reduce the urbanization factor that I've described here. At the moment, all I have is the locations of trees. For about 3,000 of the 300,000 trees, which is only 1%, I have the species. Um, we have the species largely because we visited all the trees. Um, unfortunately, it's the case that Dublin City does not record, except for the parks, they do not record the trees on the city streets. And that means that none of the data you've seen to this point was obtained by from their resources. They just don't have those resources. They don't have any information. They have appointed a arboriculturists, and that individual is currently working with us to use these maps to actually attribute health issues to each of these trees. In other words, go out and measure them and get health and species information. So we're trying to agree to make sure there's a information sharing so these data can be made freely available. We're trying to add this information by using this particular um, app which is called Curio and Curio we've given them the 300,000 trees and people can actually map the tree that they know, they can tell us what it's like, they can even indicate if that tree is now gone because this database was based upon an image taken in July 2018. Uh, so I expect at the end of summer we'll be much further along largely because people have been encouraged to go out there and map trees particularly since they're often stuck at home and they're looking for things to do in the neighborhood. Um, and then I'm also working with an individual to try and use Google Street View to randomly sample different parts of the city to try and get species information. Uh, what would be clear from this, by the way, is that one of the big things we're missing is information about trees and back gardens, which is extremely difficult to get. So we're hoping that this app will provide some of it. And then other things we're hoping to do is to go to um, landscape architects and um, basic gardening centres. Because you'll notice when you go around the streets of Dublin, you can almost always identify a 1960s housing estate with the cherry blossoms. Later housing estates tend to move toward lime trees. So the trees themselves are a fashion. So if we can identify when trees were purchased, then we have a good chance of identifying what type of species are there. Now, all I've done so far is basically told you about the physical geography of these. The obvious thing for us now to do is to link it with the co-creation project that's just begun. So the mapping part is fundamentally finished and I now have to just do the ecosystem analysis, but that won't be done through engagement. Uh, that'll largely be done using this software and it'll be supplemented by information that we can gather on the species. We're now in the stage of trying to come up with a plan from community engagement. I'm not gonna talk a great deal about that. Uh, we've had our uh, several meetings which were with individual stakeholders and then we had a big meeting, fortunately just before, the pandemic, where we had the community brought together um, in Inchicore, a College of Higher Education. Uh, we got about 70 people over the course today who engaged with us. I present information about the, the trees, generally speaking, around the city. Then they were given specific maps associated with the part of the city that they occupy. And people made notes and offered designs and there was workshops that has just been compiled. Uh, COVID affected us in terms of ongoing engagement with the community. So we look for other ways to try and um, gather information. So the community project that I described to you, <clears throat> which is based in Inchicore, is actually utilizes the help of artists. <clears throat> and one of the artists there, Shodino Sullivan, um, who's very interested in issues associated with vegetation and greening. So we decided to use the opportunity associated with the pandemic to try and get people's um, personalized maps of the walks that they take. So for example, we're all limited, actually it's two kilometers, what's in two kilometers of your house? We're all limited within two kilometers of our house. And if you look at that little network, little spiders network that you see up on the right hand side here, 
We ask people to download an app and actually map out the routes they took and take any notes along the way. Now that stuff is still being compiled, so I can't really offer any insights into what they found. But the idea is obviously that we marry the scientific information, the information that's coming back from the community to actually design a, a plan where we go next. So just to summarize, <clears throat> internationally, greeting cities is now seen as simply um, a given. Nobody questions anymore. Um, the real problem, I think, for the cities we've already built is to figure out how to insert greening spaces into those existing infrastructures, <clears throat> particularly because the space is often um, thought about and not all of it is in the public domain. I think that certainly in Dublin, what I can see, it would be good somehow if we were to incorporate citizens with gardens looking after trees within the urban biodiversity plans and not simply rely on planting trees along city streets. Um, certainly in terms of how we manage cities, I think there's often a great deal of confusion about scales. Um, I was particularly annoyed that a solution for the national carbon dioxide emissions was to improve bus traffic and bus flows by using the bus connects route, but that the plan that they had was to actually go down some of the major and some of the nicest streets in Dublin and remove the trees to allow the buses to flow in, thereby reducing carbon dioxide emissions, they hope, by getting people out of the cars. But I think at far too high a price, which is to actually, um, in some cases, I think, devastate the local environment. So I think the big challenge we face in terms of greening cities is to try and figure out the scale of which works best. <clears throat> I think one of the more interesting things about the COVID is it got people to focus a great deal more on what's in their own vicinity, in their own neighbourhood, and how can we improve the quality of the green infrastructure at that scale. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that, uh, Gerald. It's very interesting, uh, and the map in itself, extremely interesting to see that you know air quality is actually a social issue in Dublin as well. If you look at some of the areas with very uh, poor air quality, with lack of trees, uh, with lack of green infrastructure, from your map. And, um, yeah, we, but I would say that we we often fall into this trap of um, it's not only the residents that suffer from this that uh, Dublin city centre has a completely different population during the daytime. Now, it actually, it's interesting, that switch over from population from day to night, it's extremely concentrated in certain parts of the city. So I think what we need are green strategies that, that don't just look at the population that live there all the time, but we also take into account the, the individuals who basically spend half their lives coming in and out of the city. Um, actually, I meant to start, shows that I had a picture that I want to start this with. Um, do you mind if I try and look for look for just to illustrate a point? Yeah, go ahead, Gerald. Yeah. Um, how did I manage to forget it? And if anyone has any questions while Gerald is looking for his photograph or for his image, please send them in. I see quite a few questions coming in there, so um, just add them to the Q and A function if that's possible. I'm sorry, I can't find it. Anyway, the sign is in Mountjoy Square Park, which is just across the road here. Now, Mountjoy Square Park is quite interesting because it's one of the few little pieces of green, piece, piece of green space in this part of the city. And the area around it is, is notoriously deprived. But the sign at the moment in Mountjoy Park, which says that if people continue to meet in groups and continue to play football here, Dublin City Council have no choice but to shut down this park. So this is a perfect example of a small sliver of green space. Uh, and the idea is, and obviously, if you're living here and you're in an apartment, all green space become extremely valuable. And yet the green space that is available um, is under threat simply because people are utilizing it. Now, if they're not in the park, they're almost certainly back in their houses or meeting on streets. So it really doesn't make any difference, it seems to me, as to where you place those people, you still have the same problems. But putting up a sign, 
which uh, basically removes the potential for any opportunity to get outside your house and sit in the green space seems to be a, um, well, I'm not sure it's the best strategy. Yeah, we need to be improving our green spaces and ac access to green space. If we learned anything over the last number of months, those of us with gardens are, are very lucky compared to those with, with no gardens. And, you know, it's, it raises the question about, you know, equal access to green space in the communities that we're living in, but also that the communities that we're planning on building across the country. I'm just looking at the questions coming in here there, Gerald. There's a question there. Are there any plans to extend your work to other local authority areas in Dublin <clears> or other parts of the country? Well, I think it's easy enough to extend some parts of it if you do sampling. But the work that we did, uh, which was to map every individual tree, um, uh, it takes too much time. And frankly, I found that local authorities aren't really willing to pay for that type of work. I think you could incorporate, <clears throat> I mean, if I was to pick up parts of the, I think Cork and Limerick especially uh, could easily have that type of evaluation done relatively quickly through sampling. And then you to utilize the local uh, universities there to get students out to actually do the actual mapping itself. I don't have plans to do it. It took me, I mean, I've been doing this for the last 10 years. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes it's frustrating because the amount of work it requires to gather this basic information, I don't think maybe the local authorities appreciate. The amazing thing about this is that um, you would have thought that the very organizations that planted the trees might have had some information about those trees themselves. And unfortunately, they don't. It all, seemed, all that knowledge seems to reside at the lowest level where the individuals um, <clears throat> plant a bought and planted those trees. There just doesn't seem to be any data gathering at higher levels. And, and, and now kind of focus on it just leads to the next question someone has uh, just typed in that many local authorities are now prefer preparing new development plans for towns across the country and um, would you have any recommendations for how a town could be surveyed in-house in a kind of a straightforward manner I would go straight to the iTree website um, I don't know if people remember though those little um, images I showed of Waterford Cork City Centre, Galway City Centre. It's a very, very simple process that allows you to sample and give you a basic, um, basic information about the distribution of trees in your area. Now, depending on the size of the town, it might take a fair bit to actually gather other information. But you'd be amazed at the local knowledge that exists from people, their ability to identify trees and their willingness to go out there and do it. <clears throat> so that app that, we, uh, that I showed you called Curio, that allows you to actually start gathering, individuals to start gathering information about those trees. Um, but it still would be up to local authority, I think, to get that data so they could actually manage it um, and they could actually look after it. Because unfortunately, if you do it through an app, then you don't really get control over the data. I mean, the interesting thing I found about Dublin was <clears throat> if you don't know where the trees are, then for example, a planning permission comes in. Someone asks to remove a tree. Nobody has any idea what it is, or even who owns it. If it, lists, if it exists on land which is not directly inside private property, it's not clear about the ownership. Um, so I would have thought, in the same way that we keep a register of buildings, that we should be keeping registers of, tree, of trees. Yeah, well, we should have the uh, uh, place of value on our green infrastructure and our trees. Just noting that it's about 10 to 1 here. If people want to bear with us for about five more minutes, I have a few questions that you've sent in that we'll, uh, we'll try to get Gerald to answer. But I know other people have places to go, so if you drop out, that's fine as well. But I just want to see, can I uh, get through a couple of these questions? Someone asked, are there disadvantages of plants and planting trees and should certain locations be avoided? Yeah, I, well, you're right. I think uh, here's a, um, in North America, and especially in, say, for example, places that are associated with hot climates, trees, wrong species of trees can actually be a, a polluter because they also emit. So it's not always followed that trees are always ideal. Trees, if they get very, very big, of course, and not planted properly, they will heave up the pavement. They will destroy the infrastructure. So that's why I think it's very important that this idea of the right tree, the right place at the right time. I think also, if we do it properly, yes, you will have some trees that are old and ancient, but we'd have to accept that in a given period that we might harvest trees and then we would replant them, but that we would end up with a stable forest and we grow the forest rather than having endless fights about individual trees. OK, 
Okay, interesting. And then we have another question there. Do you see any evidence of biophilic design, now maybe pronouncing that wrong, being incorporated into new or existing buildings? I, well, I have seen this, but I, I'm afraid that I don't know enough about the uh, design examples in Ireland, but certainly elsewhere they are. Um, and I think there's also, I mean, when I look at some of the um, designs for new developments that incorporate, say, river systems, and we build around those types of systems, and we use the river systems as a basis for linear parks, yes, I see lots of examples of that. I think, for example, that one of the big challenges if we go for making cities more compact, uh, inevitably that means the space inside the city is going to become more, or fighting for that space is going to become more competitive. And if we have more and more apartment blocks and people give up the opportunity for private gardens, I think there's going to be an onus on us somehow to compensate by providing quality outdoor spaces. So I, whatever about a fresh landscape, uh, there's lots of opportunities, but I think the challenge will be in places like, say, Dublin or Cork or Limerick, to actually transform those places. Um, I think people have seen under after COVID what the potential is, that um, it may be that fewer people will actually commute into work and be allowed to work from home, which means that should free up some road space and afford some opportunities. But I'm surprised at places like, say, for example, the North Docklands, which is probably going to be some of the densest uh, urban living in this country. And uh, there's a part of the city where there doesn't seem to be any effort to change that landscape from very, very hard landscape into one that's a little bit softer. Um, and I would have thought in terms of climate change strategies, in terms of putting up barriers for prevention of sea, uh, sea water rise, et cetera, that'd be an ideal place where you could really put on your hat to see if you could address many issues simultaneously, quality outdoor spaces, resilience in the face of climate change and softening up the landscape. Definitely, excellent. Okay, I think on, on that note, we, I have another about six or seven questions come in there, Gerald, so I've, I've lots of questions for you, which I will, will forward on to Gerald. For anyone that yeah, hasn't if had... Any, if people have any specific information, any specific questions where I think I can answer, I'll do so. And if they have specific questions that I can't answer, I'll try and pass them on to someone who I think will have the answer. No, and thanks very much, Gerald. We really appreciate your time and very interesting and, and a topic I think that we don't hear enough of uh, here in Dublin, but also across the country. Uh, just a thanks to Gerald for joining us. Thanks to my colleague, Mary Coffey, for running the back end. And we would thank you all for listening and would invite you to join us next week on our final webinar on nature-based solutions for housing development. So thanks a million. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in and I'll pass them on to Gerald and we'll do our best to answer them. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.